and welcome to Tom Harbin University Book Club. Today we're reading from the last hours of ancient sunlight, um, the fate of the world and what we can do about it. And uh, this is from page 165, The Lives of Ancient People. From the San and the Kogi Value Community and Cooperation, we are part of the world, not separate from it. The chapter. One of the oldest cultures on earth is that of the Kung Bushman. It's an exclamation mark to make the noise of the Kalahari Desert in the northern parts of South Africa. The exclamation point in their name, Kung, represents a sound in their language which we don't have in English. It's a popping noise made in the mouth by forming a vacuum between the tongue and the top of the mouth and then pulling the tongue down quickly. There are three other sounds in their language for which we have no letters, all of them clicks or pops, made by similarly clicking the tongue against the front of the mouth or the sides of the mouth and teeth. They're such a unique culture that although they're ancient, their language contains sounds that have traveled to no other human tongue on earth. Over the past few decades, as they've become more well-known, they've asked anthropologists and linguists that they be called the San, although most texts from before the 1980s refer to them as the Kung. They and their life are portrayed wonderfully well in the film, The Gods Must Be Crazy. The San are racially distinct from the other Africans who have conquered the continent in the past millennia. Their skin is more yellow than black, and their eyes are slightly slanted as if they share a common ancestor with Asians, or perhaps are indeed an early ancestor of the Asians. Their hair is black and curly like other Africans, but they're comparatively short and thin, often standing less than five feet tall and weighing fewer than 100 pounds. The lives of the San were first chronicled quite elegantly by Lawrence Vanderpost, a South African explorer and writer. In his 1961 book, The Heart of the Hunter, he tells of coming across a small Kung tribe of about a dozen adults and children as they crossed a particularly hot and barren part of the desert. Vanderpost and his fellow explorers started hunting some game so the Bushmen could have extra food to carry on their journey toward the lightning on the horizon where, where the seasonal rains were beginning. The explorers spent an entire day hunting with their Land Rovers and provisioned the Bushmen well for their trip. As the little tribe was leaving, Vanderpost and his group stood to wave goodbye, but the Bushmen simply walked off with many smiles. No thank yous were ever given for all that food. One of Vanderpost's assistants, a hunter who'd never encountered Bushmen before, commented that they seemed ungrateful and uncaring. Ben, one of the other men in the group who understood Bushman culture, responded that to give another human food and water is only good manners and is routine behavior among the Bushmen. If the white men had been starving on a long trek and the Bushmen had found them, they would immediately share their food and water, even if it endangered their own survival, and they would not expect a thank you in response. In fact, in San Bushman culture, to eat in front of another person who is without food is considered an immoral act, every bit as horrific as if in our culture a person were to walk out onto a busy city sidewalk, pull down their pants, and defecate. Everyone would be shocked and horrified. As it happens, the San do say thank you. They do it whenever they're hunting, when they're making a decision to take a life. No animal is killed for food by the San without being thanked by them, both at the time of the hunt and later when a dance is done for the soul of the animal. And animals are only killed when there is a clear need for food. For those of us who grew up in modern civilization, it's difficult to imagine a life and culture where such fundamental things are simply taken for granted. When we stop behind a car at a red light, we don't open the door and run up to the car in front of us to thank them for being so considerate as to follow the basic rules of the road and stop for the red light. It's simply a given that everybody does that. No thanks are required. Thanking people for doing something implies they had a choice to do otherwise and did so out of a desire to be nice. But imagine a world where feeding another person is as much an automatic response as stopping at a red light. A world where a person who fails to feed or care for another is ostracized or punished, the way we give people tickets when they run red lights. Where the care of others is more important than even the care of yourself. Where the teaching, all things that you should want others to do to you, do ye even so unto them, is actually practiced. Not out of an effort but as part of a daily routine, as the normal way things are, as the basic assumption of a society. That is San culture, the way of an older culture. This, a, story of Chippewa and, a storyteller of Chippewa and Cree ancestry told me that his people have a belief that if a person visits your home and you fail to share with them food and water so that they leave hungry or thirsty, and then the creator decides to take them home at that time, they will arrive in the spirit world hungry and thirsty. He said, the responsibility for that, for that person's condition in the world, is yours because you were the last person he met and you had an opportunity to feed him. So we have an obligation to feed and give water and shelter and whatever else a person may need whenever they come into our village or our home. 
In our younger culture, we value productivity and individual possession. In their older culture, they value community. Most modern people find it difficult or impossible to imagine a world where community is more important than possessions. Yet this is how about 1% of the world's population still lives and how all of your and my ancestors lived for hundreds of thousands of years. In 1997, a group of 13 researchers released a study in which they quantified the value of all the environments on the planet. From measuring the size of the Louisiana shrimp harvest to how much people were willing to pay for access to a lake, coral reef, or other natural attraction. They concluded that the planet's natural areas were worth about $33 trillion. And then from there, I go on to talk about how that's a crazy way to value anything. And we need to be, you know, revisiting these ancient culture values. The book is The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight.